This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Melissa Valentine will tell us about flash organizations. These are groups that are formed from the internet all at once to solve a particular problem using their expertise, and then the organization dissolves once the problem is solved. They get paid by somebody who convenes them. It's called a flash organization or open call, and it's the future of gig work. There's a new way of assembling organizations called open call or flash organizations or temporary organizations. You go to the internet, you find all the people who have the right expertise that you need to advance your idea, build a prototype, test an idea. You hire those people, you pay them, they do the work. Uh, it takes weeks or months and then the organization delivers its product and you dissolve the organization. It's a not the normal way that we think about organizations and industry, but it has become attractive, especially to entrepreneurs and innovators who want to get quick prototypes or quick answers to their questions. Professor Melissa Valentine is a professor of management science and engineering at Stanford University. She's an expert on how technology influences organizations. In the time, especially since the pandemic, many of us have reevaluated the relationship of our work to our life where we do the work, how we interact with people virtually, in person. These are all areas of Professor Valentine's expertise. She's going to tell us about these flash organizations, what their benefits are, and what some of the drawbacks might be. Melissa, thanks so much for being here. You study something called open call, uh, which is a new way to do work. And so I guess my first question is, how does open call, well, work? So when I think about the future of work, so all of us do something that I don't know if we know that, that we're doing it, which is called work design. So if you want to get something done, you're going to like make a team, right? Like if you're doing like a lab study or something, you're going to make a team and you're going to try to figure out who should be on the team and what's going to help them be successful, like discovering this new thing. And you're going to try to figure out like what roles do you need and how should they work together? So the way that open call works with something like that is instead of you just like looking around your lab or look even looking around Stanford and being like, here's the students who could be part of my project. Instead, you can look to the internet and you can look to these like large groups of people who are all signed on to something like an online labor market. I mean, you could even think of LinkedIn. So basically you're just going to be like, I have a new project. Um, I'm excited about it. Uh. You post it online and then all sorts of different experts anywhere in the world could hear about your project and could want to come work with you. So that's what open call is. Okay. So I've heard of things like task rabbit and these other things where you like, you have a very focused task and you kind of put it out there is task rabbit kind of, uh, of o an open call thing, or is it, is it different, um, from what you're describing? So that's, it is a part of it. That's an example of open call. So instead of just the people that you know, who might come do handyman services for you, like anybody in the area who's logged on to TaskRabbit can hear about your job. So I'd say what's different about what I study is um, if you were going to do something that's much more complex, where you need to get like a group of people. So if you needed to hire like a whole group of people to come work on a project with you, that's the kind of thing that I study. But I think TaskRabbit's a great example of it. Okay, so this is not a single uh, subcontractor. This is actually perhaps a whole team. And I think in, in looking at your work, I think you've called them like flash organizations or temporary groups. So this is a, a real organization that you're standing up somewhat quickly. And then what happens at the end of the project? Does it go away or is it a little sticky? Ah, great question. Um, so when we were doing the flash organization study, we were thinking of this as like a proof of concept. We wanted to show that you could spin up an entire organization at like the scale of crowdsourcing, the speed and scale of crowdsourcing. Um, so our hope was for the organization to disband at the end, basically for the client who had an idea of like a mobile app they wanted built to be left with a mobile app and have had like the great experience of the flash organization, but not to be managing 30 people any longer. So at the end of the projects, the 30 people did uh, disband. So the flash organization sort of ended. Um, and then, but I think for longer, like software maintenance, for example, you're going to keep some people who are going to keep working on the project. Okay, so great. Okay, so we have this basic idea that you've described beautifully of a, of a group that's put together to solve a problem. And I think it's kind of obvious 
Uh, well, let's review. What are the benefits to the person, like the what we'll call the employer, and what are the benefits to the um, employees? Because I'm sure there's going to not be benefits, or there'll be decrement, the, you know, bad news. But let's focus on the good news first. Why do each of the two sides like this? Yeah, yeah. So starting out with the potential, like with what's really cool about this, um, what we were excited about, and and our and you're calling them employers, we'll say that the the people who ended up as the employers, what was cool about it is these were people who hadn't you know, like run entire companies before, but they had ideas they wanted produced. So they had, you know, they had something mm -hmm. that they were like, if I, I don't have the expertise and I don't quite know how to do this, but I have this great vision. So it was easy for them to sort of, you know, do like a napkin sketch of the vision and be like, this is kind of what I'm thinking. And then to start to hire people quickly on demand who like came together and help them produce it quickly. So I think it like lowers the, like lowers sort of the barrier to entry to produce something. I think it makes it easier for sort of lay entrepreneurs to kind of have an idea and to try out what it's like to manage an entire, like a large kind of complex group of people in working towards producing their vision. Um, after we did yeah. this study, um, it got, I think, as you know, like it got uh, published in the New York Times and we had lots of people write to us on Twitter and like through email and they had all sorts of ideas about things that you could do with this model. And most of them were kind of around this idea of it really like lowering the cost of what it takes to start something to kind of try prototyping something. Like I had somebody actually from yes. like the DMV in Minnesota, right? And be like, this could like help us do a dashboard on the fly. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> like it totally could. And somebody else was like, I feel like this could <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, like lower the, the uh, barrier to entry for like female entrepreneurs. Like maybe they could like get to a prototype faster without having to go through like the, you know, barriers of VC or something like that. So people seem to read into it sort of like a democratizing of like, just sort of like a lowering the barrier yes. to like what to like be able to produce something. Now, now I assume are are the, uh, so forgive this very basic question, but I assume that the group that they that they gather together spontaneously or in a flash way, they're paid. Is that right? The, these workers exactly are right. paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Do um, they I have think... to negotiate a whole bunch of contracts? Great question. Yeah. So we when we did this, we interfaced with the Upwork labor market. So Upwork has Upwork is currently configured for sort of one on one hiring. So when we were doing it, we had a team of RAs that was doing the negotiation, the one-on-one -on -one negotiation. Um, and that was, that took some time. Um, we decided that for kind of the ethics of our study, we wanted to make sure that the freelancers had a great experience. So we just paid them their asking hourly rate. We didn't negotiate at all. We just paid them their rate. <laughs> and we didn't, we were not like doing this to like try I to see. do something efficient or like save money just for the proof of concept. So I think right. it's possible to right. configure platforms to make that kind of hiring easier. Um, currently Upwork, which we used, was configured for like the one-on-one -on -one kind of negotiations. Great, yeah, that, and that makes sense. They had already put up their resumes, they had a, declared an hourly rate, and so that was a very nice, easy way for you. And you didn't have to play hardball for very understandable reasons, although in the future, somebody might wanna play hardball, and we'll get to that. Tell me from the, um, from the gig worker's perspective, what, what are the benefits or the excitement or the professional satisfaction that they get from participating in one of these? Um, I like flash organization. It's a great phrase. Yeah. Yeah. So in this, so we, because we were wanting to learn about this, we did exit interviews with all of the freelancers that who had worked on the flash organizations. And something that we heard consistently is that they really appreciated kind of like the team environment, the like interdependence of what was going on. Um, because oftentimes they are working on like one-on-one -on -one contracts, right? Where they're sort of like working more independently. So a lot of them loved the team experience. They loved sort of being part of something. I mean, it was like, we, we sprinted hard. It was like, we were trying to show that it could be so fast. So it was like a six week turnaround. Um, and there's things about that that can be stressful, but I think for the experience that we had with the freelancers who signed up for it, like it was just, it was like a really fun, there was so much solidarity to it. Everyone was kind of like in it together trying to get this done. So it seemed like working together and working on something that they found meaningful with a client who was so excited. It seemed like it was a, it was like a, it was an experience that they weren't having on the labor market as often as perhaps they would have liked to. Yes. Um, so just a couple of questions there. This is so interesting. So first of all, they're not anonymous, so they know who they're working for. Like they have real names and they can actually form relationships with the others. With So even if the Flash organization disbands or dissolves at the end, they may have persistent relationships. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of asking, is that true? 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's exactly right. And one, so one of the way that we set up this study is we wanted people who hadn't ever done crowdsourcing before or who hadn't ever like run an organization to be our kind of requesters or our employers, say. So these are our flash organizations leaders. Yes. So they were the ones that that the uh, freelancers were working for. We were sort of the behind the scenes uh, we were, had the platform that was trying to help them all do it. Um, so the, the requesters yes. and the freelancers, um, yeah, they established very strong relationships. And um, I like afterwards, they were like exchanging numbers so they could stay in touch. Um, I actually have there's right, a right. there's a guy who like sends me a happy birthday on LinkedIn every year after having like worked on this together. So I do feel like, yeah, the relationships became like strong and we've kind of kept in touch with people. That's really important. And it's not obvious from, from, you know, it's not obvious that that would happen at, on first blush, but that could be a huge source of professional satisfaction because you're getting, you have a job, you're getting paid and you're making these new contacts, which might allow you to have different kinds of opportunities in the future. Okay. So the third element of this, I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. So we have what, what I've been calling the employers and the gig workers. I think there's also kind of a software algorithmic element, at least to, to this effort sometimes. Uh, and you've written a little bit about the role of um, kind of automation in this process. So can you tell me where we are with that and, and the degree to which, in addition to all of this, there's algorithms that are working in the background, I guess, trying to facilitate the whole process? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where a lot, of, I mean, the whole thing was, was really enjoyable and kind of fun to work on, but that's really where the frontier of research was for us, like figuring out what the, the software capability was or what the algorithm capabilities were. Um, so the, 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 the two sort of, um, I would say like technical uh, capabilities that we were really focused on, one is using the platform basically to um, interface with the group of people who could come work on the project. Um, so that would be something like Upwork. Um, and the people who are mm -hmm. on Upwork basically have data that like says, this is who I am, here's what my expertise is, here's what my experience is, this is maybe like the time zones that I'm available. So like platforms basically can now interface with that and sort of understand who's available and they can convene the group of people that you need for your project and they can do it in like kind of smarter ways. So we've had uh, projects since where we've used uh, different algorithms to kind of optimize different things um, on staffing the teams. Ah. So we did one where we were trying to um, optimize how familiar everybody was with each other. That was led by uh, Neela Far Salehi, who's now a professor at Berkeley. Um, so she led a study where we were basically um, showing that the platform could be much smarter in how it was convening the teams. Um, so that's a piece of it is how quickly and, and what you're optimizing for when you're convening the teams. And then the second piece of it is the platform basically helps them work together better. So um, when the first one that we did, it was basically kind of like a project management tool. It sort of is like managing them through different stages and showing people where to like upload their deliverable or where to find their deliverable. Um, but that's those platforms have also become smarter. So another of my PhD students, Katarina oh. Licks, um, she did her whole dissertation was basically like analyzing what was possible and helping the platforms uh, sort of detect how things were going and kind of help. So she did this great analysis that was looking at the language that the teams of freelancers were using. This, in this case, it was with a company called Gigster. So she was analyzing um, how they were talking to each other and she could basically analyze when their language was sort of becoming divergent or when their language was becoming more similar to each other, the people on the team. And that was predictive uh -huh. of whether they were gonna make their milestone. So the platform basically is like helping wow. understand how well things are going and then it can kind of you know, put a flag up and be like, I think this language suggests there's a misunderstanding here or something like that. Yes. Okay. So really fascinating. So there is like this algorithm and data driven aspect to it. So, so, so many questions, uh, but, but so this is pretty exciting. Tell me, a, give me a sense, a couple of questions. First one, how big can these organizations, organizations be, or is there an upper bound before you and your colleagues believe that it's just going to be unmanageable uh, in an online situation? Has that frontier been defined yet? Oh, such a good question. And it's fun that we're talking about this in 2022, right? Because we started thinking about this pre-pandemic and then the pandemic happened. And I think that really changed people's thinking about like what's possible with remote work. Yeah. Um, so I would say that for a very um, complex kind of project, like the things we were doing, that's 
there's sort of like there's a, a there are conditions under which that becomes unmanageable. I think the thing that's interesting that I'm really interested in right now is there are also um, organizations that have no offices at all. So something like GitLabs that makes GitHub. So these are so my we, we hired a postdoc during the pandemic, Jen Reimer, um, and her dissertation was about organizations that have no offices and like pre pandemic, they have no offices. It's an entirely remote organization. Right. So when I heard her dissertation, I was like, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of like the answer to your question here, right? So you have like flash teams, they come together for six right. weeks, they build a piece of software, but like who do, who maintains it? Do you eventually like move that into like a brick and mortar office building? Um, and her dissertation was showing, she was like analyzing what makes it possible for some of these organizations are like 800 people, right? And they've been running for like a decade. So that suggests wow. that like the no office remote work <laughs> capability is like the frontier of that is much further than I thought even like a year ago or two years ago before the pandemic. Yes. Um, and then the other question that was really burning is uh, you talked about making deadlines and like a Gantt chart of progress. Is that person who's doing who's doing the project management? Are they also hired as part of this flash organization? So do you, is part of the hiring, I guess, hiring somebody who knows how to define a project and keep it moving, uh, or does that belong to the to the employer or the person who's like uh, commissioning the flash organization? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that that project manager is the key to a flash team being successful. Our requesters had no experience. They did not know how to do this. And there emerged in each of the flash organizations, someone who kind of took on that general contractor project manager role. I think that's really key. Um, right. So in our case, they were hired from the labor market and they really just took on a lot of responsibility and they were they were great folks in the in these cases. Um, the study that we did at Gigster kind of showed a similar thing, but at Gigster, so this is a company basically that does flash organizations, like it's like a, you know, downtown San Francisco for-profit company, uh, where ours was like a proof of concept. Um, but they actually have people who are employed as project managers. So I think being a project manager oh. of something like a flash team is is kind of like a new capability. It's like a new kind of job right. in the workforce. Right. And, and I imagine that that's a person who has to have a very close relationship with the, again, I'll keep using the word employer, the person who has the vision needs to tra transmit that vision to somebody who can operationalize it. So that would be a very valuable skill in, a, in an emerging whole new market. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman, more with Professor Melissa Valentine next. Welcome back to the future of everything. This is Russ Altman and I'm speaking with Professor Melissa Valentine about flash organizations and how they work. In the last segment, we got a flavor for who might want to convene one of these organizations, why somebody might want to work with one of these organizations, and how data and algorithms can sometimes help you create a really good team. But in this segment, Melissa will tell us that there are drawbacks and things to worry about, especially from the employee side, the gig worker, there's a question of long-term stability and allegiance to an organization or to a mission, which is harder to have when you're jumping between organizations. So Melissa, for this segment, I wanted to start out asking, what are the challenges? Where are things not quite solved or you know, rough edges to this new way of doing work? Yeah. So I think I mentioned we got a lot of engagement after this New York Times article came out. There was a lot of discussion on Twitter. People reached out, gave us a lot of thoughts. So one comment really stood out in my mind after, uh, from this like Twitter conversation. And somebody tweeted and they were like, if this is so great, why are you trying to get tenure? Which is basically lifelong employment, right? So like if this sort of like flash employment, <laughs> like a gig wow. employment is so great, why are you trying to get tenure? And I was like, you know, that's a great call out, actually. I really appreciated that perspective. Um, and I think it really highlights what is sort of like the risk or like what people are concerned about here. And I think rightly so. Um, and that it's that this model could introduce a lot more precarity into people's kind of like the steadiness of people's income or into like their benefits or kind of like the social the social like uh, safety net that's like built around long term organizations and long term employment. So I think when you yes. have flash organizations that are sort of working outside of all of those protections um, and out of those like long term relationships, that's where the risk comes in. That's where there could be increased precarity and uh, where you just that's want to really, make, yeah. really interesting. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, it's interesting to me because, yes, um, you know, it, 
it's interesting to think about tenure or any long-term employment because we all have our good days and our bad days in any job, in any person. And you could imagine that a bad day in a job that's a steady job, especially if it has a history of good performance, they say, okay, Russ just had a bad day or a bad week, or he just didn't perform very well on this particular project, but he has such a track record, we're just going to move on. Whereas you could imagine in this environment that most recent not-so-great performance could have an outsized impact in your ability to get the next gig. And so there's there's kind of no smoothing out of long-term contributions. Are there perhaps technical ways to address that? Um, so that's an exa- that's a really nice way to put that. Um, interesting technical way. To, I'll have to think about that for a minute. I will say I think that there's like a social arrangement <laughs> that I think can help solve it because I think right. academia is actually kind of an interesting model for it. Because um, there is a way that what we do with research projects is a little bit more like flash teams. Like I don't work on something for ten years. I work on something for like six months because it's new and it's interesting, and I produce it, and then you know I move on to the next thing. So I am sort of doing projects. Um, but within that, I yes. do have people who are invested in my long-term career and I have income over all of that time. I have mentorship over all of that time. I have colleagues over all of that time, health insurance, retirement. Um, so projects don't have to be at odds with all of those kind of good relational social things. Um, I think at present, these, these two worlds are very separate. You have like really institutionalized organizations and then you have gig work. Um, and I think there's a lot of I think that there are people who are trying to kind of close that gap and innovate things that could close the gap. I think it's not just, I mean, I I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's not just technical stuff. I think that a lot of what has to happen there is like culture, social policy sorts of things. Um, I have seen cool technical stuff, but I don't think it's quite enough. (laughs) That's it'll be stuff like micro internships or stuff like that important or like micro equity. And I think those innovations are cool. And I think it has to happen in kind of like that larger landscape. It, it, are there performance reviews uh, at the end of one of these uh, to get, to make to try to tag people? Uh, I'm asking because it seems to me that this platform that you've been talking about, so you've talked about Upwork and Gigster, they could play a role in providing continuity. Uh, it kind of in this, and I hate, I can't believe I'm saying this, kind of in the way that Uber and Lyft may provide continuity for drivers, so that even though each individual gig is a is a you know a short term relationship, Uber and Lyft kind of have an ongoing relationship with these folks, and so. But but I hesitate to say that because I don't think most of us believe that Uber and Lyft have solved these problems at all. So I'm, I'm but I'm wondering if it, at least in theoretically for you as a somebody who studies organizations, could that middle that middle layer of a platform be this source of stability or is that dangerous in some way that I might not appreciate? I think that's the right place to be looking. Um, I think that because you do end up with like a network of people who are all kind of having the same experience. And there's there's a lot of great research. So Mary Gray has done some of this that looks at the way that people in these networks basically find each other and they collaborate and they support each other. And some of the stuff that they would typically get from an organization they're getting from the community, from like the network of other workers and other freelancers. So I think that that network community is really important. And as you're saying, I think the platform companies that basically are curating those networks are also really important. And that's like a place where maybe we could see, I mean, I can't speak for them, but you you could imagine because they right. are the ones who have the, the longitudinal relationship with the freelancers that that might be a place where they could think about a lot of the, the, the kind of the support and the, stuff, the kind of stuff we're talking about. You know, another thing that comes up is this idea of allegiance to the mission, uh, the mission of the of the flash organization. And I this comes from my own experience. So, you know, I, I live in the biotech world and I talk to companies in the biotech world and they they get a lot of software programmers, uh, but they tend not to pay the software programmers for a variety of reasons quite as much as the big IT companies like Google and Facebook pay. And so I said to them, you know, well, why is that? And they said, well, first of all, we are looking for people who find the mission that we have, like discovering a new drug or making a new diagnostic. We find that if they're not tied to our mission, they're more likely to go to the highest offer. So they'll be at our company for six months, then they'll get a call from Google and they're gone. 
Whereas if we have people that we've vetted to be committed to our long-term vision, they might actually say no to Google because they like working on something that might lead to a new drug or a new diagnostic. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you've seen any dynamic. And, and then the one other story, very quickly, is in my own research, I've used Amazon Turk, which is kind of one of these kind of gig worker things. And when we were recruiting people, there was there was a commenting meth message, uh, an ability for the workers to comment. And a lot of them specifically commented that it was refreshing to be working on a Amazon Turk project that was related to health and health research because it wasn't the typical thing that they did. And so they kind of told their friends, hey, you might want to check out this opportunity because it seems to be a worthwhile cause. And hopefully what we were doing was worthwhile. That, that's We'll put that aside. I think it was. So what about this very fuzzy, soft idea of like allegiance to mission and, and stuff like that? Are you seeing people? It, your last comment made me think that this is a dynamic. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's such a great story. Um, and I do think that that meaning at work. I mean, this isn't my core research, but as like an organizational behavior trained like researcher, I think meaning at work is like one of the most important things for people. Um, so I think that's a great story. So I would just underline the story that you told there. I'm, I, I, Thank I you. think <laughs> I've seen, yeah, that's a great, I think I've seen a lot of, um, and just, I think the nature of the engagements that we've done, I've seen a lot of more like market dynamics where it is a little bit more price sensitive. Um, but I think yeah. even, even within that, I think people do find meaning and actually, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I mentioned Mary Grace, so she's a researcher who has studied Mechanical Turk, and she actually like went into people's homes who work on Mechanical Turk and kind of studied what it means to them be, to be doing that kind of work. It's a great book. It's called Ghost Work. Highly recommend. Um, and she found, uh, like, basically people find meaning in the work that they do. And it's really important to understand the meaning that people bring to the work that they're doing. And that's an opportunity just to understand kind of, I mean, not to be intense, but like to understand the human experience. It's like, what's the meaning right. that people bring to whatever work it is that they're doing? Absolutely. And, and and we've all been forced to think about this during the pandemic because the conditions of our work have changed that we it kind of helped all of us realize what it is about our job that is important and core and what things is not. OK, so as we as we come to the final minute or two, let me just ask you, what is the future of this? Where where are the big research questions from your, your perspective and what can we look at as as, as in the in the future and, and and be excited about this emerging capability? Yeah. Well, I, I'll pick up on what you said about the pandemic kind of changed the way I think a lot of us are thinking about a lot of things. And one thing that I was really struck by as the pandemic was hitting and people were adjusting is that there was a way that the, that crisis made everyone kind of have to like rethink work and kind of think about designing work and like designing their teams and like, you know, figuring out how teams should work together and how to solve problems. I even think of my, um, my office neighbor, Bob Sutton is another professor at Stanford. And he used to send me anytime he would see an example of a flash team in the world, he would like send it to me and be like, look, they had to like create a flash team. Um, I think his daughter was part of um, setting up like a COVID testing center. Um, and so she had to like pull all these resources together really fast and like use software to do it. And um, so he, anyways, so Bob always sends me and he's like, look, it's a flash team in the world. And there's just so many examples of like something happens and you have to like kind of adapt and be like, ah, like, how do we solve this? Who are the experts we need? How do we structure them? How do we help them work together? And I think that basically the, the resources that are available right now are, I mean, it's like unlike what we've had, the access that we all have to these kind of resources to solve problems is kind of, it's new and it's exciting. And uh, just to like end on your point about project managers, like all of us kind of can like look for ways to you know, improvise ways of like pulling these resources together and solve problems in kind of more flexible and dynamic ways than we've seen before. Great. So and, and, and you started out with a great story about how people who are may not be in a big company can still figure out a way to get their idea uh, off the ground. And that, that should inspire lots of us who have everybody who has an idea, which is everybody. So thanks to Melissa Valentine. That was the future of gig work. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. You can follow me on Twitter at R.B. Altman, and you can follow Stanford Engineering at Stanford E.N.G. The Future of Everything team wants to acknowledge the loss of our colleague Ray Avila, who died suddenly and unexpectedly in late October. Ray was a sound engineer, and he edited every show for the last three years. He was great to work with, and we will miss him sorely. 
We want to send our condolences and best wishes to his wife, Christy, and to all of his family and friends who are feeling this loss acutely.